Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we pray to the Holy Trinity. Uh, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you ever asked, like, why things are the way they are, uh, why do I think about things the way that I think about things? Why does someone else think about things the way they think about things? And in this kind of question that I ask in my own life, and then in my priesthood, um, in 15 years of marriage prep, uh, this was coming up a lot between couples, uh, fiancés that would come in, engage to each other, and they'd be have one kind of a question or another about the, the, their fiancé, the other person, their, their future spouse. So this, this question as to why, and answering it, uh, came up, and then I started reflecting on, on Genesis. So that's where we're going to begin tonight, is with the story of Genesis. So we've heard it a thousand times, and yet the, the point of this presentation is hopefully to connect some of the dots for you between Scripture, liturgy, the tradition of the church, but also like everyday human life and how this unfolds. So Genesis, God creates the garden. And is the garden good or bad? It's good. And then God creates Adam. Out of what? Dust. Somebody said it. From dust, right? And then Genesis 2.15. The question is where? <coughs> Who has their Bible? Somebody have a Bible? Phone Bible? I see a Bible over there. Genesis 2.15. Who can get there first? <laughs> you got it? Read it. Make sure you read it out loud for everybody. The Lord God then took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. So say that again. The Lord God then took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. So where was Adam not made? Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden. Right, so what's the opposite of a garden? Desert. A desert, right? In Greek, a wilderness. So Adam is brought by the Lord God to the garden and placed there. Now he's actually made in the garden. I talked to Scott Hahn about this a couple years ago. He's made in the garden. The garden is in a, in a condition of wilderness or chaos. Chaos meaning that things are, are still wild and unnamed. And then when Adam cooperates with God to name all of the creatures, that's the cultivation. That's the cultivation that it's talking about, that's being described in 215. Now, the Hebrew word for, cult or for cultivation would be shamar. And any, if you went to Jerusalem today and talked to any uh, Jewish-speaking person, and you said Shamar, they would do a direct English translation to the word guardian. And what that means is that Adam then, in Shamaring the garden, cultivating the garden, is like the good marine. He's brought there, right? He's introduced to it, he's wrapping his mind around it, and he's like the good marines. When, marines, when a marine helicopter lands, what do the marines do? They all jump out and they set up what? A perimeter of defense, right? So there's a zone of safety on the inside, so the odds go in favor of them and whoever and whatever is on the inside, right? And they can repel anything that would attack them. And, G and that's what Adam is doing here. He's, he's walking this, this wall and he's protecting the good within as he cooperates with God and naming all of the creatures, right? Wraps his mind around him. He's like, whoa, this is amazing stuff, right? And as, as he's doing that, that's when he's shamaring. So he's not only a guardian of the garden, he's now a guardian of the good. Right? And he unites himself with his God, the Holy Trinity, because he's made, as the scripture says, in their image and likeness. Being made in their image and likeness is re a reference, uh, theologians would say, to the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, walking with Adam in the garden. So as he's shamaring this, what's his problem? What does he experience? Aloneness. Aloneness, right? He's alone. Now, John Paul II, in his Theology of the Body, says that if God doesn't allow aloneness as, as a sign of imperfection, aloneness is allowed as, as a sign of incompletion. In other words, he's now searching for his, his other. He's now searching. You ever felt alone, Adam? Yeah. You like it? Yeah. Ah, right? Son of Adam. 
Adam. <laughs> <laughs> so he's alone. He doesn't like it. So what happens? What's the next step in the story? Takes the rib from his side. How does he get the rib? Puts him to sleep. Puts him to sleep. What kind of sleep? Deep, Deep sleep. sleep. Deep sleep. Deep sleep biblically is what? Death. So theological question, does God take away Adam's free will, his free will, put him to sleep, open him up, take out the rib, close him up, uh, put free will back into him and then wake him up? Or, uh, or does Adam freely die? Freely go into it freely cooperate with this, freely enter into this relationship with God. <laughs> what would you say? <coughs> Which one? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right? this I, was, is a, that was a, that was a look of unknowing. Interesting question, right? Would God ever take away a gift that he's given? No. No. Adam freely cooperates. Has full faith in the Trinity. That should, in laying down his life, he'll be what? Resurrected. You seeing connections here? Yeah. So did he actually die? Deep sleep. That's a. It's not an actual. It's not an actual death. Okay. Right. But it's a death in God where you're, you're resting. But that's a whole other, like that's a whole PhD. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, freely, he freely lays down his life. Does that follow? Yeah. For who? God. For who? Keep going. Who does he freely lay his down, life down for? His bride. His bride, who is? Eve. And Eve is created, and when he sees Eve, he says, What? At last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Right? At last, my loneliness is over. Ladies, you will never know right, what, it's, what, the, what the men feel when they're alone. It's not a brain thing, it's not a heart thing. It's a marrow of your bone thing. The reason, now, that's just my conjecture, marrow of bone, because that's where God goes to answer his aloneness, is in the marrow of his bone. You can walk up to him. I was in higher education for 15 years. You can walk up to any freshman guy on moving day and look him in the eye and say, you're alone, and he'll either punch you or walk away. <laughs> right? It's a place, he, there's a haunted look that comes over a man's face when you just go and say you're alone. Right? If you look at... Uh, the initiation of, of any men's group, right? At, whether it's an informal friend group, right, or something else, right? They're they're always addressing the aloneness fear that a young man has or that a man has. Uh, ladies, when you see uh, your 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 brothers, your your yeah, your brothers, your dads, your grandpas, right? Your boyfriends, your fiancés, your husbands, right? And there's a haunted look on his face, right? That, that's probably his aloneness coming through, right? So. Guys, we don't like this, right? So we fight it. So he creates Eve out of what? Out of the rib. Now, is a rib al alive or is it dead? Are your ribs alive, alive. or dead? Why do you say they're alive? It's because it creates blood for your body. Okay, so exactly right. Your rib right, has marrow on the inside. Your bone has marrow on the inside. So it's actually producing red blood, red blood cells, right? I read, and I think it's right, that the, the, the adult rib is also one of two bones in the adult body that produces stem cells. I think your, free, your femur is the other one. Which means that Eve is made from a, a, a thing that's alive, whereas Adam is made from inanimate objects, inanimate material. Which means, ontologically, from a philosophical point of view, she's a higher creature. <laughs> So she's the mother of life. Now this is where faith and science intersect. Interestingly enough, did you know that the mitochondria and the cell structure of every human person on the face of the earth points to the fact that we all originated from a single female? Right, take that to a biology class. Right? Alright, so mother of life. Right, what else does the rib mean? What do your ribs do? What do your ribs do? Okay, she holds the heart. She's made from the part of Adam's body that understands, the, that protects the heart. Guys, have you ever had a woman in your life say something about you, right, that was true but that you didn't like it, so you got an attitude with her because 
You didn't want her to know what was going on with you before you could articulate what was going on with you. <laughs> because it's just like, how does she even know that? Well, it's because that's where she's from. She's from the part of, of Adam's body that protects the heart. So a lot of times she gets Adam before he gets himself. Right? And doesn't that dress drive us crazy, guys? Right? It's like, well, how does she even know that? Why did she even say that? Right? I, that's what's going on. That's where she's from. Right? That's part of her feminine genius, John Paul II says. The feminine genius is intuitive. She understands this because that's where she's from. Third, uh, the third part about the rib is it's from the side. And the Hebrew understanding of that would be that she's equal in dignity. So he's like, God clearly makes Eve. Adam does not make Eve. But God chooses to make Eve in communion with Adam. So while she's her own person, right, there's a complementary relationship there. And in that complementarity, she has her own mission, which complements his mission. So they have separate missions, separate roles in the garden, but they complement each other. And this is, again, the dignity of woman, the dignity of man. And the final thing is she's the last creature to be made, so she's the crown of creation. In other words, she is the queen of the creatures. Does that follow? And whereas Adam is shamaring the garden, right? And he names the creatures and moves the garden to order. When Eve is created in the garden, her mission is to connect it. That's her genius. When she wakes up, everything is named. She doesn't wrap her mind around it. She intuits it. And that's what we call a, a woman's intuition uh, in colloquial terms. In that, she moves the garden from order to unity. And whereas Adam is shamaring it, Eve is uniting it. Now, how does a woman unite a garden? In her vocation to unite, she does it through intercession. She's interceding for Adam. She's interceding for the, the garden. She's interceding for all of the things that he's, he's helping go in the right direction. She's connecting those things and making sure that things are flourishing in her own right. And in that intercession, she's interceding for her marriage. She's interceding for her community. She's interceding for her school. She's interceding for the neighborhood. Everything right, that, that you ladies intercede for, right, that's what she's doing. That's where it comes from. She's interceding. Even a woman's body is made to intercede right, for the life of a young child as she delivers oxygen, nutrients, blood, all of the things that are the giving of life, that's intercession right, on a biological level. And that's what Eve's body is made to create. So that's the theology of the body uh, for, for Eve. Now, if you're, if you're God and you show this to the angels, why is it the Friday the 13th for the angels? Whole other species. They're not there. They're not there, okay? But they're like, that's good. They're hobbits, right? We're good. We have the beatific vision. Why is it a big deal for the angels? Church fathers talk about this is a, a th key thing for the conversion of, or the issue of the angels, right? And we're, what they choose. They're looking at this, and God creates this Adam and Eve, and they've got a, a DNA code and a bloodline. DNA code and the bloodline. And when he reveals this to the angels, they're looking at it, they're like, hold on, hold on. Because uh, if you look at creation, what's the lowest thing to exist? Rocks. Inanimate objects, right? They exist, they're better than unicorns because they're real. <laughs> what's the next thing up? Plants. Plants. Plants have everything rocks have, but more. Right? So basic scale of creation, next thing up from plants? Animals. 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 Right? They have everything plants and rocks have, but more. And then above animals, highest form of animal? Humans. So Plato and Aristotle were, were social, rational, political animals. Right? We're self-aware. That's pre-Christian thought. Next thing up above humans, next species? Angels. So if, if uh, um, some scientists can argue right, that aliens created the human race, then the Catholic argument for a species that exists that, that's completely rational without a body is reasonable. Even science should take that into serious consideration. But that's the next order of species. Right? Above the angels? God. God. 
when God shows this to the angels, this DNA, DNA code and this bloodline, he's showing them it's the DNA code and the bloodline for the Son of God. Will be a direct descendant of the first parents. And as a direct descendant, when God takes on the human genome, he's showing them that when he becomes one of us, he makes us like him, and the scales change. Angels watch you go to the Holy Communion, but they can't receive it themselves. Because the Son of God became one of us, became a member of your species, and laid his life down for you. And that changed the scales. Are you tracking? Some angels accept the plan, some angels reject the plan, one angel attacks the plan. What's his name? Lucifer. Who does he attack first? Adam. Adam? Who said Adam? Adam, why? I don't know. You drew it on that side. Are <laughs> 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 you a psychology major? <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. Yeah, he hits Adam first, right? In other words, like you look at the schematics, right? And uh, Scott Hahn points this out. He like, how does he even get in to talk to Eve? Well, he has to get past Adam. So Adam's walking on, he's walking the wall. He's looking over, overlooking Happy Valley, and he sees across the valley superior creature, superior intellect, superior power with deadly intent. And he says, okay, I can lay down my life again and do battle. Right? For the garden, for my bride. I can choose the mission over my flesh. Right? And, and heroically die, and in heroically die, have full faith that my... Heavenly Father will raise me from the dead again, and I'll be blessed. Or I can stand quietly by, right, physically live, but place faith in myself and not in the Father. Place faith in myself, lose faith in the Father, physically live, and spiritually die. And in that, Adam makes, he miscalculates, and he chooses to stand quietly by, and he falls. And his fall becomes his fear, and his fear are overwhelming odds. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> I think you're uniting right now. You're <laughs> yeah. is, is that then a sin, to not lay down your life for that? Yes. Yeah. He didn't so lay down that, his life for his bride. For is, the that his first, is that the first sin? That's the first sin. Apple? Sin of pride. Okay. So the church fathers summarize that as a sin of pride, but what is pride placing faith in yourself and not in your, not in, in your God? Right? It's, rely, it's self-reliance. It's not like a de healthy dependence on God. Um, it's, he turned to himself for the answer instead of turning to his God for the answer. Does that make sense? So overwhelming odds. Now the reason I say that is that, ladies, you have no idea, generally speaking, how many times the guys in the room as sons of Adam Right? Calculate the odds every day and every second, even including this conversation. And you're like, we don't believe Father. Right? Well, that's okay, because you're not sons of Adam. All right? <laughs> <laughs> the odds means what? The odds means, does this go in my favor or does this go against me? Right? And a lot of times women will mistake that in a young man, especially a single man, as selfishness. Right? Because they say, well, he's just thinking about himself. Right? Well, in a way, yes, but in a way, he has to figure that out in order for the odds to go in favor when he brings a bride and offspring into the garden, right, and they live out their vocation. If he doesn't have that figured out, he's, he's not going to be able to do it, at least effectively. So it's important for a guy to figure that out. Um, so Adam falls. Now Lucifer then gets in and actually talks to Eve. And her vocation, where he's attacked Adam and shamaring overwhelming force, now he attacks Eve, whose vocation is to unite, and she listens to him. And the church father says the act of listening is an act of unity. So instead of listening to God, instead of listening to her spouse, what, who is she listening to? She's listening to a liar who opposes God and is bringing her a message of untruth. And she, as she unites with him, she falls. And her fall becomes her fear. And her fear is not being chosen. Or heard or enough. 
Ladies, your reactions to not being chosen, not being heard, not being enough. What was your reaction? It's very true. You felt it? <laughs> yeah. You felt it? Okay, ladies, put words on what you felt so the guys have a window in your world. Just say it. What, like, like, that hit me like what? Just hit you in the heart, like a ringing true. It rang true. What else? Usually in a women's only group, the, the ladies, you'll, you'll actually physically flinch. That was okay. the reaction, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was my reaction. Like, oh. yeah, that was my reaction. <laughs> it, takes, it takes the breath away. And this is the lie that Eve falls for, and this is the lie that the daughters of Eve now fall for. This becomes the cross of the daughters of Eve, and this becomes the cross of the sons of Adam. So what was lost here is paradise. And the Hebrew understanding of paradise is it's harmonized. When you go to your wedding day and you're standing there, and the nuptial priest is praying the nuptial prayer during the Eucharistic prayer, um, what you hear is that the one thing in this story that was not lost was what? Marriage. John Paul II points out that Adam and Eve created are created married. It's the first sacrament. The created married, the one thing not lost is marriage. What was lost then? If, all things, if everything else was lost. Here we had perfect health. Now we have to go to the doctor. St. Thomas Aquinas says it was impossible for us to even get sick here. Does that make sense? Here we have perfect knowledge. Now we have to go to college. Here we have perfect eyesight. Now we have to wear glasses. Here we have perfect economy if you're a numbers major. Right? Everything, everyone had what they needed to the degree they needed it when they needed it. A perfect distribution system. Consequence of the fall is imperfect distribution of goods and services. Here, there's a perfect, integra perfectly integrated economy. Now we have to invent money to measure the exchange of goods and services so it's more or less fair, whether it's a shell or a dollar bill. The Aztecs use shells. We have a dollar bill. Does that make sense? Here, there's perfect psychology. Everything that modern-day psychology studies right, is a consequence of a fractured psyche in the human race. Here, there's perfect identity. Right now we have a fractured sexual identity that's playing out on campus in a very well, real way. Right here we have a uh, perfect communication. Now we have to learn a language. Right? Every major at the university is evidence of a fall, because every major is trying to rebuild something that we lost. We only use 10% of our brain now. Why? Are you following? That that's what we lost. The church father said, Jesus says, pray always, because here we were always in perfect communion with God, the Holy Trinity. Consequence of the fall is we even forget God on a daily basis and have to be reminded to pray in order to be in communion with God. So as this, as this kingdom has fallen, right, what do we see? Archbishop Fulton Sheen in his, in his biography says that there's the consequence of this is it affects the character of Adam and the character of Eve. It means that we tend toward excess, and deficiency. And virtue. Excess. Deficiency. And virtue. So what do we call a man who's called a shamar in his vocation but is excessive in shamaring in a fallen world in his character. In other words, he's willing to kill everything and everyone around him in order for him to live. Who is that man? The barbarian. What do we call a man who's called a shamar, but runs from everything, is deficient in order for him to live? Coward. Coward. What do we call the man who's called to Shamar, prepares for battle, but, but wisely chooses his battles? The virtuous man becomes the king. Is this making sense? Is this tracking? Fellows, don't you see each one, like every one of these three characters, not only in yourself, but also with your brothers on campus? 
the guys who are willing to cut everybody down, the guys who run from everything, right, and guys that are really trying to be kings and master themselves so that they got something to give. Is this making sense? Over here for the ladies, what do we see with the ladies uh, called to unite in, in her vocation, but is excessive? Ladies, what would you say? You, uh, what I've heard women say is, is trusts too much. What about a woman who's called to unite, but is a little worried about everything? We say no to low trust. What do we say about a woman who's called to unite but prepares to unite by discerning who she's going to trust and open her heart to? We call her the queen. These three female characters, these three male characters exist in every story, in every culture, in every civilization in the history of the world. These three characters exist in Chinese manuscripts, the Aztec pyramids, the Egyptian pyramids, uh, Druid uh, legend, Viking stories, and all the way back to Greek and Roman myth. These six characters are everywhere, including Disney movies. A woman who has no to low trust. Hmm, Frozen. Making sense? Like you could just name the movies and the country western songs that are written about these two <laughs> Are you tracking? Why are we fascinated with these six characters? Because this is real life. This isn't just a, a Christian story or Jewish story. This is the human story because it's the Human Genome Project. Is this following? Now, if you're God and you're looking at this fallen kingdom, right, and you have a desire to save it, and you have a desire to send your son into the incarnation, what do you need for that to happen? Practically speaking, scientifically speaking, biologically speaking. Queen. You need a queen. Huh. A descendant of the first Eve. Can she be broken? No. A broken queen. You know, what do you need? Perfection. A, and how do you get perfect? How do you get a perfect queen? Perfectly united with God. How? Through virtue. How? How? Grace. Can she do it on her own? No. Christ does what? Grace. Grace. Oh, grace. Right. Exactly. What does the Son of God do at the moment of Mary's conception? You need the Immaculate Conception. Right? The conception of a perfect queen who's perfectly saved by Christ's grace. And so what does the Son of God do at the moment of his mother's conception in the womb of St. Anne? He perfectly saves her. He brings her the gift of salvation as a free and unmerited act of grace, is what the Catechism says. And in that act of grace, she's saved from the two consequences of sin from, that Adam and Eve both faced, which was death and disease. She can't get sick. She doesn't have to die. But the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, when you read that document, right, says that she could have chosen to right, enter into the human condition right, and go through some kind of death, but that's a falling asleep. It's not a punishment for sin. So you have to, to read that document to understand what happened here. But Jesus saves Mary at the moment of her conception. And this is the Catholic answer to the Mary problem that our, our Protestant brothers and sisters have not answered yet is that we understand that for her to pass the human project on to the Son of God, He brings salvation to her so that what she passes on is immaculate. And that's the Immaculate Conception. Does that make sense? Just imagine, right, uh, in, in, her, in her, just her gene line, right, there's, there's cancer maybe, right? Jesus brings salvation or she's free to that immaculate. She becomes an immaculate queen, right, who then is born, is raised, and then an angel visits her. What's, her. what's the angel's name? Gabriel. Gabriel. What level of angel is he? Is he like the low-grade angel, right? Like driver's license angel, or has he got like the Mercedes? <laughs> right? He's the, the archangel, right? But he's the archangel, right? Oh, who, does, who betrayed the first Eve? Mm -hmm. An archangel. Yeah. So can we go back? Why, why was it necessary that uh, Mary be sinless then. So Mary is... Like, could, could God have used a sinful uh, vessel? Right. So so what she, contri she contributes to... So that's a good question, right? So the question is why would an... Uh, why couldn't God use a sinful vessel, right? Uh, and it, she is uh, a sin... Uh, 
it would be against God's nature, right, to do that. It would be, um, like he can cooperate with us, but for, for him to take on the human genome, um, I think the argument is, is that he needs a perfect creature. Because he himself is perfect. So to unite with something that's imperfect, especially inher in inheriting original sin, that's a problem. We can go deeper there later, though. Yep. So did Mary have free will then? Yes. But she never sinned once? No. Why? She's saved and perfectly united with God. So she totally could have chosen... She's to totally free. Yeah. Okay. So she's like Eve? So she's like Eve, but she undoes what Eve did. And when she's visited by the Archangel Gabriel, he doesn't tell her a lie. He's from God. He tells her the truth. And when she listens as an act of unity, she then intercedes for the human race. And what are his words to her in that moment as a chosen daughter of God? He says, Hail, highly favored, chosen one. Different trans depending on the translation. In other words, he undoes the lie that the daughters of Eve have bought into. In undoing the lie, he says, You are chosen, you are heard, you are enough, and God is with you. And undoes the lie of the first Eve. When she says yes in her fiat, she says yes to the truth, and instead of conceiving a lie, she now conceives salvation in her womb. You see how God is rebuilding this fallen kingdom? By undoing the fall and helping things fall forward, right? She conceives Jesus in her womb, and at the moment of his conception, his flash, flash of light, her womb becomes a garden, a garden of life, a garden that's a new paradise, a garden that's harmonized, a garden that's perfectly integrated. And she intercedes for the human race for nine months as she knits the cells of his body together with her body. Is this following? Is this tracking? I'm like watching faces and I'm getting, okay, yes, okay. All right. Her body becomes, who does she go then, and who does she go and visit um, when she conceives Jesus? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, whose struggle was what? Infertility. Is that biologically deficient or excessive? Deficient. deficient. By the power of the Holy Spirit, she conceived John the Baptist and is called in the queenship. And in her queenship, the two women celebrate the first women's Bible study, and we call it the Magnificat. The first women's Bible study. Does that make sense? Why do we have women's Bible studies? Because Mary, the mother of God, went and had a Bible study with, with Elizabeth when she conceived Jesus and, and the other was, was bearing John. It's a, there's a good that happened there. Jesus goes to Mary Magdalene who trusted too much. It says, go and sin no more, draws a line in the sand, right? Not just for the town, but for the world to never treat a daughter of Eve that way again. Undoes it, shamars the garden, and what does she do? She washes his feet with her hair. And he calls her into queenship and restores another fallen daughter of Eve. He's rebuilding the kingdom. What do we see in the lives of, of Jesus then? Uh, it, he's born in Bethlehem. He goes to uh, John. Uh, Joseph is a just man, a kingly man, the scripture says. So he gets him to Bethlehem. Then they go to Egypt because there's a barbarian who's killing babies, right? And then what do they do? They're coming back to Bethlehem and has a dream from an angel. says, don't go there. Go to Nazareth. That's where Jesus grows up. And Joseph shamars Jesus and Mary for those 30 years in a carpenter shop. Does that follow? Protects the good, is a guardian of the good. And John Paul II writes, guardian of the Redeemer, as a reflection on the life of St. Joseph. Then Jesus goes where for 40 days? The desert. Oh. Where the first Adam was made. Recalibrates the odds. Shamars the garden for 40 days. Fasts and prays, does Exodus 90, <laughs> is tested by who? Lucifer. Lucifer. Three times, passes or fails the test. Passes, rebukes Lucifer, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And you have Lord of the, Re Lord of the Rings, return of the king. The king is back. And he's saying, this is my kingdom. Then where does he go to perform his first miracle? 
Cana. What happens at Cana? Wedding. wedding. So is he going to Cana or is he going to a wedding? Which is more important? A wedding. A wedding. Why a wedding? Because that's where the human race began. He's going to the origin of the human race, which is the sacrament of marriage, to reclaim his kingdom, where the human race began. Every time you stand at the altar, every time Father and I stand at the altar with a couple, we're standing at the origin of the human race. Does that follow? Performs his first miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. And in performing his first miracle there, right, what he's saying, he refers to Mary, his mother, as woman, which is the reference to the mother of life. The first Eve. He's saying, you are the first Eve. The scripture says the third day after the fourth, or the fourth day after the third, Jesus arrives in Cana. I can't remember which order, but what's three plus four? Seven. How many days of creation? The biblical key to a new creation, a new genesis with Jesus Christ. He's saying this is the new beginning, this is the restart, this, let's get this going. And then he becomes the king who begins rebuilding a fallen kingdom. If you're blind, a consequence of the fall, you can see. If you're hungry, you get fed. If you're lame, you can walk. If you're, ex if you're ignorant, you get educated. If you're possessed, you get exercised. And then he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and keeps watch all night. <coughs> this is now in the Holy Week. This is the liturgical year we're talking about. We went from Christmas to Easter into Holy Week to Easter. Keeps watch all night. What do the apostles do? Is that excessive or deficient? Deficient. deficient? deficient. Goes to them, says, Could you not keep watch with me for an hour? Divinely institutes the holy hour, does another man's Bible study on kingship. He's rebuilding, rebuilding the, the sons of Adam. Moments later, soldiers from the high priest show up, and what happens? Before that, Peter does what? Cuts the ear off with what sword, right? Chops it off. Is that excessive or deficient? Excessive. Jesus takes the man's ear, fuses it back onto his head. Think of, if you're a vascular surgeon, what does that even look like? <laughs> right? You're like, what did he just do, right? And it's the laws of biology now obey the king. The king now has dominion over his kingdom again. The natural law is now back in sync with God, as it was in the beginning. Does this make sense? And we'll talk about the science intersection here in a second. Jesus picks, puts his ear back on and then turns to Peter and says, He who lives by the sword dies by the sword and does another man's Bible study on kingship. And what does it mean to be a king? He's putting things back together. Right? Then what happens? He's taken and he's imprisoned. Right? And instead of then eating from the tree, as Adam did, Jesus now goes to the tree of the cross and he carries the wood of the cross on his back. He bleeds on it, sweats on it, is nailed to it and dies on it, and chooses to have faith in his Father that he'll be raised from the dead, as opposed to placing faith in himself. And in that, he undoes what Adam did. And in undoing what Adam did, he dies on the cross, and transforms the instrument of our, the sign of our fall into, the instrument of our fall into the sign of our salvation in the cross. As he dies in full faith on the cross, then what do we see happening? His side is pierced, and we know uh, do any doctor is going to tell you it was not the stomach cavity, it was the chest cavity because blood and water flow out. If it had been the stomach cavity, it would have been human waste and bile. Right? But what flows out is, is blood and water, which is what surrounds your heart when you have massive heart trauma, which would have been the garden of Gethsemane the night before. So guess what? He's dead now on the cross, and he's freely laid down his life, having full faith in the Father undoing the lie of Adam and the fall of Adam. And now his ribs are opened up. And blood and water flow out, the blood of the Eucharist and the water of baptism, the church fathers say. And he lays his life down for his queen, the church, the mystical bride of Christ. And she unites herself with his mission. In other words, Ephesians, what is it? Ephesians 5.25 um, she submits to that. Submits means what? It's violent to modern ears. Um, but what does submit come from? Sub missio. In other words, under the mission. What is Christ's mission? Uh, Ephesians 5.25 says, uh, Wives, be submissive to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives as 
Christ loved the church. How did Christ love his bride? What did he do for his bride? He died for her. That's the mission that the daughters of Eve are being asked to stand under and support. Ladies, you will never know how you empower a man when you say, I'm grateful for you, I appreciate you, I respect you. Every man will run through a wall if you tell him that. <laughs> Those are all what submissio means. I respect you, I appreciate you, and I'm grateful for you. That's what that means. And he will die for you. All right. That's what it means. That every encyclical written about the church, the bride of Christ, says her mission in the world is to unite it. To unite the people of God to God. She's constantly interceding as the bride uh, for humanity uh, on behalf of Jesus. So this, friends, this is not just the story of the Bible. This is not just the story of your vocations. Men, brothers, you're called to shamar. Ladies, sisters, you're called to unite. In your vocation, every man is called to shamar, whether he's a priest or a married man. In a vocation, every woman is called to unite, whether it's as a sister or as a, as a married woman. This is your campus. And you have the descendants of the daughters of Eve and the sons of Adam walking in your dorms, on your fields, in your classrooms, in your projects. And they're struggling, struggling against being barbarians and cowards to being kings. And against being, uh, not uh, trusting too much, not trusting at all, or trusting in the right amount. And ladies, you are the ones who need to intercede for your sisters to let them know that they are chosen, that they are heard, and that they are enough. And a lot of times you're the only ones who can tell them that because you're the only ones in that place with that person in that context at that time of day. And it's a time of day when you're the only one who will be that voice. You, you are the only one that will be that Gabriel for them in that moment. And that could be a life-changing moment. And brothers, over here, I was, uh, I was director of residence life um, on campus for six years. And it was 3 o'clock in the morning and, and I'm driving by the freshman guy's dorm. And I see the back door just fly open in the parking lot, and this guy comes flying out, lands on his back, and 25 guys walk out and, and gather around it. I was like, okay, so he's, he's, probably ca he's probably caused this for himself. Let's find out what it is. So I do basic crowd control, pull the car in, squeal the tires, come to a stop, pull the attention of the crowd off of him and onto me, right? Get out and say, you know, hey, I hope you guys are having a nice day. But no, I didn't say that. I said something else, right? I said something else, got their attention, right? I got the leaders, you know, three or four leaders of the group, right? And said, guys, can you help me get the other guys to bed? They're like, yes, Father, we'll help you do that. They're shepherding those guys up, right? We sit down with three or four of us, and I'm like, hey, what's going on here? And they say, Father, he threw a punch, right? And then he punched the fire extinguisher, right? And he's just going off, and everybody, I'm like, hey, man, what's going on with you? And he's like... I just drank a half liter of vodka, Father, and I'm really sorry about the fire extinguisher. His hands all bloody and it's you know chewed up by the glass and stuff. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, Well, what really happened? He's like, I got a call this afternoon that my grandpa had died. So was that man a barbarian, a coward, or a king? What kind of man is is sad and frustrated when his grandpa dies? The king. So my interpretation was, was off. I thought he was the barbarian, he wasn't. He was a king who was a, deeply saddened by his grandfather's death. So did he get all kinds of write-ups and consequences and fines and stuff for, for disorderly? No. We bought him a ticket home. Right? We offered him a ticket home to go home to his grandpa's funeral. Because he's a king who was heartbroken over his grandfather's death. It changed the way we approached him. Brothers, if you aren't learning the stories of your brothers on campus, right, to know why they're doing what they're doing, Right, then you may run the risk of misinterpreting their intent and who they actually are and who they actually want to be. Does that make sense? Only you can do that. Father and I have got 24 hours in a, day, a day just like the rest of you. But if you're there at that time and in that place, you can speak into it and change a man's life by understanding him. And that's what it means to be a brother. Okay, we'll open it up to, to thoughts and questions, if that's okay. Reactions? Yeah.
How do you go deeper into like, <coughs> this stuff? Read more or like, I guess. Yeah, where are the materials? Yeah. All right, so this is like, yeah, this is 15 years of marriage prep. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I would recommend Archbishop Fulton Sheen's Three to Get Married. Okay. I'd recommend any book on uh, on how to build trust with your brothers. So trust building stuff with brothers, right? Because the, the, the currency uh, on campus for brotherhood is trust. All right, so this is just a little theory I've got. If you have time, you want to see uh, just a, a theory? Okay, because of this, if you look at who, how Adam and Eve experienced things, um, a lot, what I noticed on campus was that um, men begin uh, with, um, let's see, let me think of my word here. Men begin with distrust and move to trust. So if you watch freshman guys on move-in day, right, the, they're shamaring their life, right? So what's, what's their castle? It's their life, right? It's who they are on the floor. Right, so that means that when that guy opens his trunk and moves into the, into the building, he's decided what you're going to know about him and what you're not going to know about him. On the floor, he's decided what information he's going to share with you and what information he's not going to share with you because he's shamaring his kingdom, which is his life, right? And he's making sure he moves uh, before he lets anybody into the castle. Everybody's deselected, everybody's distrusted, and then as trust is earned, as the currency of trust is built up, then what happens is he starts to let guys in. So what do we see? We see that by November, he's like, well, these are, the, these are the guys I run with, right? But he may not say, these are my best friends, right? And then he says, maybe by uh, December and January, next mark in the calendar, he's going home for Christmas break, and he's like, you know, college is pretty good. Um, and he comes back, and he's like, this is my posse, right? And then mar by March, he's saying, these are my friends. And then, you know, maybe by the end of the year, maybe sophomore, junior, these are my lifelong friends, right? So what happens is, men build alliances between castles and to get to that then the next step is the, the fire in the middle so they all go to a bonfire and decide who they can trust right and then at the bonfire right and deciding who they can trust it goes down to about two or three right and then of those two or three they decide who they're going to let actually into the castle and it takes about eight, six to eight months which helps us understand why men's ministry right takes longer up front does that, does that make sense? How to make inroads? Because the currency of trust has not been built up, and it has to be, right? And you, and you have to be good at bro code in order to build trust, right? So you're here in a distrust stage, and somebody makes an off-colored comment, right? Like a nutty comment at a, at a gathering, at a party, or whatever, and you're just like, yeah, I'm just not going to engage that guy. <laughs> right? Like, oh, right? just like, because he, he, he blew it, right? He's like, he's acting crazy in a, in a non-crazy situation, or... He, he mishandled information that I shared with him, right? And that mishandling, boom, mistrust, that guy's out of the garden, right? Like, I'm not letting, I'm not opening the walls up. It's done with that guy for at least three years. Right? <laughs> but a guy who's like, Eddie steady, right? Constantly earning trust, constantly honoring, regularly there, father, right? Re like, you know, like, you can trust the guy. Guess what? Then he moves into a zone of trust, the drawbridge comes down. And a guy can get into his a guy lets you invite you into his castle. Does that make sense? For the ladies, move from trust <coughs> to distrust selectively. So selective distrust. In other words, freshman move-in day, what happens? Like you open the door, you get somebody moved in, right? And her entire car is color coordinated. Right, the, the microwave is also the same color, color as her bedspread. What? She's uniting her garden, and her room is her garden, right? Right. And then what happens? You open up the roommate's car, right? And the roommate is color coordinated with the other roommate because they're uniting, creating a garden, right? In other words, they're trusting right up front. And then you go into the, the floor right, that night, and the doors are open. The pictures, like 50 million pictures, on every wall, and on the desk, and on the poster, and inside the closet, right? Because they're trusting, right? And then there's a, there's a, a slumber party until 3 o'clock in the morning, the opening night, is they pull all their mattresses out 
into the hallway and talk and open scrapbooks until that point. Right? Because they're united. <laughs> it's trust and then trust and then more trust. But if that trust is betrayed, you're cast out of the garden. You're deselected. If she personally feels and realizes you can't trust, then she deselects you. And then she goes into this mode of either trusting too much or not having no to low trust. How does this play out in the life of a young woman? Uh, where you know, father and I could, could tell you stories, but this is, this is, these are a couple examples where mom and dad, her Adam and her Eve in her life, never said I love you. Never said I love you. And the net result is she then gets to college and she's looking for love and she is excessive in trusting. She trusts too much. Right? Or she's never heard it, so she gets to college and she has no to low trust. She's frozen, right? She doesn't let anybody get close. Where do these behaviors come from at the undergraduate level, at the university level? It comes from our stories, right? And then our reactions to those stories and our basic instinct to move from trust, distrust to trust, or trust to, deselect, to selective distrust. Here's just another analogy for you. A couple moved into a neighborhood and uh, she had, she, they had three kids and she went on a walk, right, went throughout the neighborhood and got to know all the neighbors and connect with, connect with everybody, right? So she got to know Mrs. McGillicuddy and Mr. Jones and, you know, the McGee's and everybody down the block, right? And comes back to dinner and is like, this is an amazing neighborhood. I'm so glad we moved here, right? Everybody's just awesome. To which her Adam says, you know, I'm going to go on a walk myself tomorrow, right? It's Saturday, I'm going to mow the grass and go on a walk. So he makes a walk and comes back for dinner the next night. And he says, you know, everybody's great except Mr. Jones. And she's like, what? Mr. Jones is awesome. What are you talking about? Like, the kids loved him. It was awesome. Da, 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 da. He's like, no, I did a data search, right? And Mr. Jones has got major issues. Like, you will never take the kids over to Mr. Jones. <laughs> Right? He moved from distrust to deciding who he could trust. She trusted and then had to move. So that's where the complementarity of the two right, comes into play. Another example would be in how the Adam and Eve intersect is um, if you're at an intersection, right, and some of you heard this this morning, but if you're at an intersection right, in, in marriage prep, uh, we process this where he's like, I don't know why she's always happy. She's giggling. She's listening. She's humming. Right? He's like, I have no reason. I don't understand. Like, where's the odds here? I don't understand why she's always happy. Like, what reason does she have for always being happy? Now, women, you feel a little bit beat up by that, but he really doesn't understand why you're happy. <laughs> like, he, he really is like, what's the reason? Like, what's, what is that, right? And so then he's like, I'm glad she's happy. I'm not sure what. So she's there, and I'm like, here's what she's doing, I tell him. She's looking at the 50-year-old man in the minivan with the dent in the back, thinking, wow, that's a nice color. She's looking at the kid on the motorcycle across the intersection thinking, I wonder what his mom's name is. And she's looking at the family in the sedan with the groceries in the back thinking, I wonder what they're going to make for dinner. She's uniting the intersection. He's like, huh. Okay. He's like, do you want to know what he's thinking? She's like, yeah. I was like, he's looking at the 50-year-old man in the minivan with the dent in the back wondering if he has car insurance. <laughs> <laughs> he's looking at the kid on the motorcycle across the way wondering how fast he's going to accelerate through the intersection if he's a safe driver or not. And he's looking at the family in the sedan wondering what their medium income is and whether he'd be a good neighbor or not. In other words, is he trustworthy? <laughs> he's shimmering the neighborhood. He's running or the intersection. He's running the odds on the neighborhood or on the intersection in order to know if it's safe for, you, for him, you, and everybody in the van to go through. And she's like, no. I was like, yeah. She's like, she looks at him and she says, really? And with a total bro face, right, he's like, yeah. <laughs> this is how Ad, the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve complement each other in the mystery of God's plan. This is what your peers on campus could benefit you he, hearing you talk about and engage them. I was on a flight from Pittsburgh and, and, and a Buddhist priest was there and he said, what do you Catholics believe? And I said, I, we did this. He's like, that's what Catholics believe? And I was like, yeah. He's like, I believe that. Because it's the human story. Every culture, every civilization, every era has these six characters. Because it's our story. Catholics have the privilege of telling it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. 
as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you in your mission here. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.